Well, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Cliff May. I'm the founder and president of uh, FDD, and a warm welcome to everyone in the room and everyone watching. And thanks for joining us today for this conversation beyond legislation, transnational strategies for countering religious persecution. We're pleased to host this event alongside the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief during their important ministerial taking place this week. Today's program is one of many from FDD's Turkey program. We're proud to have support and guidance on this project from a distinguished uh, board of advisors. And for more information or to sign up for the latest analyses from our Turkey program, for all of our programs, uh, various areas of focus, just visit our website, fdd.org, fdd.org. Uh, we're glad to be joined today by diplomats and religious leaders from around the globe representatives of the executive branch, including the Department of State and the Pentagon, experts from the policy community, and several domestic and international media outlets. Uh, for guests new to us today, I want to share a bit about FDD. We're a nonpartisan policy institute uh, founded just after the attacks of September 11, 2001. We are, I believe, a reliable source of timely research, analysis, and policy options for Congress, the administration, the media, and the wider national security community. We're glad to share our research and analyses with allied governments, but we take no foreign government or foreign corporate funding. Uh, in addition to the folks here at FTD's headquarters, I'd like to welcome those tuning in over live stream. We invite all of you to join in the conversation, which we'll be live tweeting at FDD. Uh, at this time, I'd also like to ask you to please silence your cell phones. I'm going to test your patience just a little bit uh, by providing a bit of context. I spent a couple of years as a commissioner on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And I wish I could say that we at uh, USERF, the U.S. government, the broader international religious freedom or IRF, IRF community, have made substantial progress. But I think that's not the case. In theory, everyone everywhere has a right to freedom of religion or belief. Indeed, that's said to be a universal right. In truth, it's not. It's certainly not believed by those who rule China, Iran, North Korea, Russia, Pakistan, or other countries designated by USERF as countries of particular concern, the diplomatic euphemism for regimes that most egregiously violate religious freedom, including by means of torture, imprisonment, and other forms of severe punishment. I've long subscribed to the view that the right to believe or disbelieve as one chooses, as one's conscience dictates, is the most fundamental of freedoms. So long as rulers persecute those they rule for what amount to thought crimes, all other rights, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, representative government, will remain out of reach. Last week, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo launched a bipartisan commission on unalienable rights. It was immediately attacked by one what one might call the human rights establishment for having too many religious scholars among its members. Uh, one of the critics quoted in the New Yorker called the commission a thinly veiled religious fundamentalist panel that aims to cut back the human rights of people all over the world. I did note that this commission was launched last week. I think this is a profoundly misguided view and I'm going to attempt to explain that at more length in my Washington Times column this week. One objective truth that I hope we can all agree on, freedom is pre preferable to tyranny. Not for dictators, perhaps, but for the rest of us. I'll go further and say that regimes not progressing, however slowly and incrementally, away from tyranny and toward greater liberty should be disdained and disfavored by Americans and other free peoples. Our relations with them should be constrained. Am I being judgmental? Absolutely, and I make no apologies for that. So now let me one more time unapologetically welcome you and then turn the mic to my, over to my friend and colleague, our moderator icon, Erdemir, who is a senior fellow here at FDD and a former member of the Turkish parliament. As an outspoken defender of pluralism, minority rights, and religious freedoms in the Middle East, ICON has been at the forefront of the struggle against religious persecution, against hate crimes, and hate speech in Turkey. He is a founding member of the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief. So with that, Icon, thank you, and over to you. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, thank you all for coming. 
Um, it really means a lot to us that you're here because this is one of the eight side events during the second uh, annual ministerial to advance religious freedom in DC. This is one of the maybe 100 side event panels in DC. Uh, and it's, you know, there, there's fierce competition uh, for audience, so it's great to welcome you all here. And it's also a particular pleasure to be moderating this panel of all panels uh, because there are three colleagues whose work I admire, with whom uh, my, paths, my path has crossed uh, again and again. Uh, and it really is a great, great privilege and honor to host you all at FDD in this joint panel with the IPP Forb. And uh, just as a reminder, since the International Panel of Parliamentarians for Freedom of Religion or Belief, in its longer form, we'll take the entirety of the panel. We'll simply refer to it as the IPP Forb. But, you know, so that's the acronym. <laughs> Let me very quickly go over uh, the, the bios of the distinguished panelists. Uh, we can't do justice, so I'll just give you the highlights. Uh, Farahnaz Ispahani served as a member of parliament in Pakistan and media advisor to the president of Pakistan from 2008 to 2012. She is currently a senior fellow on the South and Southeast Asia Action Theme at the Religious Freedom Institute and a global fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center for International Scholars. David Anderson is a member of parliament in Canada. He was first elected in 2000 and subsequently re-elected five times. He currently serves as Shadow Cabinet Secretary for Human Rights and Religious Freedom. He has hosted parliamentary forums on religious freedom and also worked to pass Motion 382, which unanimously declared the Parliament of Canada's support for religious freedom around the world. He's a founding member of the IPP Forb and the current chair. And the last but not the least, Sharon Nazarian is Senior Vice President of International Affairs at the Anti-Defamation League while heading ADL's work fighting anti-Semitism and racial hatred global, globally, including overseeing ADL's Israel office. And she is also the, 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 the mind and heart behind the ADL's new task force on Middle East minorities. Welcome again. And without further ado, let me start with you, Farahnaz. Uh, you are unique, uh, especially concerning today's topic, because you have multiple hats. You have the hat of a former legislator, and you have the hat uh, of both you know, a, a prolific scholar as well as an advocate. Uh, with your multiple hats, uh, could we ask you to reflect mm -hmm. on the work you did in Pakistan uh, at the national legislature, but also the work that took you beyond Pakistan uh, beyond sectarian borders and beyond faith borders. Uh, when it comes to pushing back against religious persecution, when it comes to defending religious freedom, uh, what have been some of your challenges and what have been some of your inspirations as a lawmaker? Um, I would say um, going back to Pakistan uh, with the restoration of democracy with the former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, um, really changed my life, which is such a cliche. But I think, um, like a lot of educated Pakistanis, we don't, we don't really live in the real world. Mm -hmm. The real world of what, as a member of parliament, you see. Because you have constituencies, you travel all over the country, and you meet people from the majority but you also meet people from my, the minorities, specifically minority religious groups. So there was a change in my thought process. There was also the silence, the total silence in Pakistan's parliament about um, events that took place affecting religious minorities. Um, it went from Shia Muslims being taken off a bus at the side of the road by the Taliban and their IDs were checked to ensure there were Shias and being gunned down and the Sunni passengers being put back on the bus. It didn't merit 30 seconds on the floor of the house. Um, then we go into what is even far more depressing because it's Shia Muslims have some numbers. They are about 20% of the country. 
and they're still considered Muslims. But if you look at, say, the Ahmadiyya Muslims who have been uh, struck off as being non-Muslim, or the Christians and the Hindus, Jews are long fled from uh, Pakistan, very early 1940s, 1950s, most of them. So you start to see, number one, there's silence. And then the second part of it is legislation. How from um, the constitution of Pakistan to laws like the blasphemy laws, which are the worst blasphemy laws in the world, they carry a death penalty. All of these things were sort of central to what happened with a young Christian uh, farm worker called Asya Bibi. That happened during my term in parliament. And I saw two of my very good friends, uh, the Muslim governor of Punjab, Salman Tasir, who tried to take up the case of Asya Bibi, and my friend uh, Shabazz Clem Clement Patti, who was our minister for um, religious affairs and who was a Christian. Both were gunned down, massacred, murdered. Shabazz outside his house with no witnesses, and Salman by his own bodyguard. The other bodyguards stood in a row and held their guns while one murdered him. What happened to Mumtaz Qadri? Okay, he went to jail. Our government managed to get him the death penalty, etc. But what happened after that? That murderer, Mumtaz Qadri, has had an Islamic Sufi shrine built in his memory. Wow. People go and pray to him as a saint. So that is Pakistan. When my husband and I had to flee, I wrote a book on Pakistan's religious minorities. And after that, I started really understanding that I did not like religious advocacy, where people only talk about their own communities. That's not where the world is now. For me, a persecuted Christian in the Middle East is as worthy of my voice or time or money a Jew in France today, a Muslim anywhere of any sect. And that's where I think when we're talking about transnational strategies, your topic today, why it's so important, we have to get out of our little, little cubby holes and really develop something transnational because I feel we're in trouble. Okay. David, you're certainly one of those individuals who have gotten out of that neat hole. And in fact, your own political and intellectual journey also took you to Pakistan. Maybe starting from those experiences as well, could you give us the journey that the IPP Forb took uh, from very humble beginnings, where we met at the University of Oxford in 2014, maybe a handful of lawmakers. And now you work with 300 legislators from 70 countries. Could you tell us the humble beginnings and where IPP Forb has come today? Thank you. I want to thank uh, FDD for allowing me to speak to you today. In 2010, I it was looking around for something that would be of some consequence to people and interest. And as I looked around our parliament, there were a number of people who were working on things like human trafficking and some of the ju uh, justice issues. Uh, Erwin Kotler was covering human rights issues. A couple of my colleagues in my party were as well. And I realized nobody was doing anything on religious freedom in Canada. And I thought there must be a, a niche here for someone to begin to highlight some of the issues around religious freedom. And so I started off just by hosting a forum on Parliament Hill called the First Annual, it was optimistic, First Annual Parliamentary Forum on Religious Freedom. And so we brought together seven or of the different religious groups to talk about their history of persecution and pressure that they had faced. And we also brought a, a, a family in who had a personal testimony about, about the crisis that they had gone through. In uh, February of 2011, I was invited to a meeting on Parliament Hill and went to it and met a very unobtrusive gentleman from Pakistan, it was Shabazz Bhatti who had come to Canada to visit and I know that he was offered the opportunity to actually stay in Canada but as a minister he, he said I have a responsibility back to my people, I need to go back to Pakistan and it was three weeks after that that uh, he was shot just outside of his home. 
And for me, that was a, a bit of a fundamental a challenge, I think, when I, I realized this is the price that people around the world are willing to pay for this issue while I sit in the parliament in Ottawa without, you know, without a, a threat, basically, to, to me in any uh, sense of the word. So we, we began to work on a number of issues, and, and um, I did a couple more forums or whatever. The motion that, that was mentioned a little bit earlier, we brought forward to the House and were able to get that passed as, as well. But in um, summer of 2014, there was an invitation for a number of us to go to Oxford to a, co a conference on religious freedom. And when we got there, it was the all-party group of Britain, I think, had been part of it. The uh, United States Commission was part of the inv invitation. Bring Among Young University, I think, was part of that as well. And so we sat down, there were about eight or ten of us who were legislators who were at this conference. We just started talking about, is there something that we can do for parliamentarians around the globe that would strengthen their resolve to deal with this issue? And so we started talking, what, we could set up an organization, we do a number of different things, and there was a decision to try to set up a network that would support parliamentarians inter interested in this issue. In uh, November, we met back in Oslo, uh, courtesy of my friend Abed Raja who is now the Deputy Speaker in the Norwegian Parliament, at his invitation we came back and we signed on to what was called the Oslo Charter, which was basically a declaration that we support Article 18 of the United Nations uh, Declaration and that uh, and, uh, ICANN was in, at both of those meetings and part of that. And then we moved forward from there. And uh, it, it, it's been a bit of a surprise to us, I think, how quickly this has evolved. Uh, we had uh, partners in various places. We had a, a meeting in New York in 2015 that attracted about 75 or 80 parliamentarians from around the world. Uh, later, we had a meeting in Berlin in partnership with CAS that brought about 90 parliamentarians from around the world. And IPP4 has just caught on, I think, in people's minds as something that they can use to help them. Now, we're not an organization. All we are is a network. Uh, we have some funding primarily from the Norwegian government right now. We're on a three-year funding cycle. So we have enough funding to do a bit of training, a little bit of travel, a little bit of encouragement of people. Uh, but what we've been doing is, is um, encouraging parliamentarians who are interested in this issue to set up their own local FORB groups. So we don't dictate to anybody from outside. We are a, a group of people with extremely different backgrounds, political interests, social interests. Um, there's uh, religious faith interests. It, it, it's just uh, whoever's interested in Article 18 and supporting the three principles that are found there, uh, we will work with. And uh, so we've been able to do that. We now have, as was mentioned, about 300 members around the globe from about 70 different countries. And we have a number of national groups that have been set up, a number of regional groups that are set up as well. Southeast Asia, South Africa, right now in Southern Africa, we've had a Latin American group that's been very active. Uh, some of us were allowed to go into uh, in, in Myanmar, actually, before the, the really big trouble started. Uh, we've been in Nepal a couple of times, trying, encouraging them to come up with better legislation. They had a constitution that put in place a, a secular constitution. Their enabling legislation then began to pull back some of those freedoms. So those are the kinds of things that we're doing. We're not dictating to anyone. We'd like these national or regional groups set up. If they come to us and say, can you give us some help and support and some training, then we try to do that and to work with them. In, in encouraging this principle of religious freedom that is so critical around the world. I'll stop there. Thank you, David. So Sharon, three of us, we have the, either the current or former <laughs> legislator hats, mm -hmm. but no one in this group has had more interaction with lawmakers around the world. Yeah. I've had the honor of working with you at the ADL's Task Force on Middle East Minorities, and I know what your schedule is like. You're <laughs> traveling the world, meeting national uh, members of national parliaments meeting, you know, supranational parliaments. Uh, could you reflect on your very own experience of interacting with legislators around the world in defending uh, religious freedom and pushing back against persecution, hate, and bigotry? Thank you. First of all, I also want to thank FTD for holding this very important panel, in my view. I want to thank IPP4 for being such an important forum today, badly needed in the world that we're in today. I also want to really thank ICON. You know, you really exemplify example of what you've discussed is needed in the world today. So your work, I commend it, and thank you for bringing us together today. And I'm really uh, happy to be here. Uh, my personal story is, you know, also relevant here. I'm Iranian-born, Iranian-American of Jewish faith. So uh, my family was personally impacted by the 1979 revolution in Iran, and that's what brought us to America today. Um, I joined ADL about two years ago, um, and for those of you not familiar, ADL is an institution that's over 100 years old. It's a Jewish-American institution that was created to first fight the defamation against Jewish people 
and at the same time understand that we need to secure justice and fair treatment for all. So from very early on, our founders understood that unless we connect um, the protection of all vulnerable groups, that Jews around the world can also not be secure. So we are very much a U.S.-centric organization. We have 25 uh, field offices in the U.S. We're immersed in communities across America. And my work and my team's work is really bringing some of those best practices around the globe to the international community. Now, a big part of what we do is advocacy. And um, in addition to education in terms of trainings and, and um, bringing some of our know-how to both schools um, and youth, but as well as law enforcement and others. So that kind of advocacy brings me to the offices of legislators around the world, and that's what Icon, you're, Icon, you're referring to. Um, I come with a huge um, menu of issues that ADL stands for and wants to elevate at every moment. Uh, and the task force that you sit on, um, that we just launched last year, <coughs> focusing on protection of minorities in the Middle East, religious, ethnic, gender, sexual minorities around the Middle East, is something that is really reflective of what ADL is doing today. Um, some of the best practices that we bring and we can actually bring to legislators is our experience with hate crime laws that we started here in the U.S. in the late 1970s. As a Jewish organization, we started tabulating, collecting data about incidents against Jews in the U.S., so anti-Semitic incidents. Um, from that experience where we saw the numbers were showing us, wow, this is a real problem, we started and drafted the first hate crime legislation in America and we begin to do that state by state. And today we can tell you that 45 states have now have state level um, hate crime legislation. So I bring some of that know-how that ADL has acquired over the decades to legislators around the world and try to share some of those best practices and say, here's what we've done in America, here's what we've learned, how could this be helpful to you in your communities? How could you work with your own law enforcement in making sure that hate crime is acknowledged, recognized? Um, of course, we know that legislation is not the end all and be all. Change has to happen in society through education, through some of the other tools we have. But definitely engaging with legislators is a very important part of what we do. And I take that a very, as a personal mission to do so. So I'm happy to discuss more, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to come back to it if you need more details on that as well. In fact, let, allow me to highlight some of the work sure, you do. Because sure. when I was a, a lawmaker in the Turkish parliament, ADL's global survey on anti-Semitism right. was one of the resources I used. And it showed, to my shock, that on the average, Turkey was more anti-Semitic than Iran. So on Rosh Hashanah, I had a press conference at the Turkish parliament, you know, holding a mirror to my co-citizens, telling them, <laughs> did you know that we are more anti-Semitic than Iran, right. you know, the Islamic Republic of Iran? So then I had the motion to set up the first ad hoc committee on anti-Semitism in Turkey, which of course didn't materialize, given Erdogan always has rock solid majorities, but at least it's now on the record. So at least there were those of us who recognized yeah. we have a problem, which is always the first step. So thanks to ADL for if raising may, that. If I may, yeah. one more point is that legislators are always sometimes, some, also sometimes can be part of the problem. Oh, yes. And that's where my focus is today uh, in Europe, especially in the UK and the Labour Party. So when you see a, a mainstream political party basically hijacked by the extreme factions of that party, um, bringing in um, not only Stalinist, not only you know, anti-capitalist, anti-Western ideology, but immersed in it is anti-Semitic ideology. Nice. That they continue to say, we're not anti-Semitic, but yes, they are. I mean, legislators could also be really a big part of the problem, and I think Farron has also referred to that. And David, I, it's, it, we have to look at the tool on how we can use it best. And legislators can be on part of the solution, but also part of the problem. Exactly. Farhanas, back to you. And since you have that, those multiple hats, I think you're in a unique position to help us. You know, because in the, in the audience, we have advocacy organizations, representatives of faith communities. We have uh, diplomatic core. We have media. With your insights into both worlds, mm. uh, as a former lawmaker, what would you ad advise uh, advocacy organizations and mm -hmm. faith communities in reaching out to parliaments, uh, in working with parliamentarians, and also with your uh, t Religious Freedom Institute and Wilson Center hats, uh, what would you also recommend to lawmakers 
uh, to your former colleagues, you know, how should they mm. work with advocacy organizations, faith communities? You know, how, how can we make this bridge stronger? Um, I'm going to answer this indirectly, in a way. Um, I, th I feel today that, and from what the title of the talk is today, Beyond Legislation, yeah. because as you very rightly pointed out, many lawmakers today and many political parties are the problem. Mm -hmm. Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan won the election by saying over and over again that he was for the blasphemy laws and he would never allow them to be yeah. changed. Now that's an elected parliamentarian plus prime minister. So I would talk about when you go beyond legislation, yeah. right? Yes. You have your faith-based groups and you have legislators, uh, le uh, lawmakers as well. But what I've seen here is basically whether it's the United States whether it is a country in Europe, whether it's a country in the Middle East, freedom of religion and belief is not central to policy making anywhere. That has to change, basically, right? So you have to recognize that issue. And at this moment, it's those faith-based NGOs um, and individuals who are really carrying the torch in a really big way. And events that are taking place today um, are reported in a way as being an event. So even if a lawmaker addresses them on the floor or a faith-based organization takes it up, it is recorded as a number, an event, right? The first attack on a Jewish cemetery in France was reported as an event. Mm -hmm. No, it was much more than that, mm -hmm. right? It, we should have seen it as a, a process, not an event. And I think well, what we need to do right now is that we have to stop looking at these things as individual acts of persecution. So the France, I gave you the example of France, and in Pakistan, you know, basically over 70 years, it started somewhere. It, these things kept being reported as events lawmakers got away with so many things, but there was an event. Okay, it's the Yusuf report, State Department report, excellent reports, no teeth. Mm -hmm. So today, to create a, transact, a transnational uh, movement where it's agreed within participating countries that, okay, what, you know what, Turkey? Your legislators are not going to get visas to come to the United States, to Western Europe, to Canada, to Australia, to whichever country, Israel, whichever country it is. You have to have teeth. A jurists and um, uh, judges who are, uh, you know, who are saying, committing people on blasphemy crimes, fake blasphemy crimes, no visas. I mean, I'm just giving you an example, but this is all doable. But instead of, you know, the U.S. doing something or, you know, your organization doing something, there has to be this transnational network. And that's why I thought this topic was so brilliant. And because what's coming now all over the world, we have forgotten the Holocaust. We have forgotten genocides. We have forgotten many, many things. And we need to stop looking at them as our community. This happened to our community. No more grievance-based. It should be, okay, it happened to you, happened to you, happened to you. We see these signs. How do we move forward? And thank you, Farahnaz, <laughs> for reminding our title beyond legislation, because we have seen with our own eyes. Do you see the legislature, though? Yes. I'm standing on the floor of the house right now. There's the emotion. Bravo. <laughs> Sorry. But we have seen in, 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 in the US how yeah. using some of the very tools you have just offered make a change. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure people who follow FTD's work know about the case of Pastor Andrew Brunson, yes. a North Carolina pastor who was held on ludicrous charges 
for two years in Turkey. He was held without an indictment for 17 months. He was accused of being a spy. He was accused of carrying out the coup. He was accused of bombing one of the prison buses. You know, all sorts of ludicrous charges. And after 17 months, guess when Turkey released him? When global Magnitsky sanctions against two Turkish ministers were okay. issued. Yeah. Within two months, yeah. Pastor Andrew Brunson was on a plane out of Turkey. So it seems where laws mm -hmm. failed, where maybe advocacy organizations failed, mm -hmm. uh, you know, policy beyond legislation, right. you know, mm -hmm. policy with teeth, as you say yeah. it, right. uh, made a difference. So yeah. on that, that's a great example. Yeah. And on, on, yeah. on that point, let me turn to David, who is still uh, in Parliament, um, and uh, maybe two issues, but feel free to go in, of course, other directions as well. One is uh, IPP Forbes' own work mm -hmm. has been facilitated uh, by this range of advocacy organizations and faith communities, too. So this was not just an, a number of legislators coming together and moving forward. And maybe you would uh, agree with me that if I said that if we didn't have all these nameless heroes behind IPP for all these advocacy organizations and faith communities, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have made it this far. And second, also going back to our title, Beyond Legislation, and building on Farah Nas comments, IPP Forb has also done a lot of work that's beyond legislation. You know, the letters, the visits, you know, IPP Forb has done work which was unimaginable, either through national parliaments or through international interstate organizations. Could you also share some of those with us? That's a lot for a couple of minutes. Yes, but <laughs> I have full confidence in your <laughs> articulate <laughs> nature. I would actually like to start, I guess, with focusing on legislators because I believe that what you have said is true, but I also know that one or two committed legislators in any legislature can make a huge difference. We do have a unique role to play, and I've been aware of that as long as I have the privilege to serve in this position, but we are the ones who set much of the, the, the if you want to call it the atmosphere in a country in terms of uh, approach towards legislation, approach towards the judiciary, approach towards communication. And so if we can find those one or two people who are committed to a cause, and in our situation it's the, the notion of religious freedom in Article 18, we have found that they can make a tremendous difference. And typically they also pay a tremendous price. So mm -hmm. my friend Icon, for his bravery, is now in this country but estranged from his own country. My friend Abed Raja in Norway lives with fairly regularly being threatened with death by a number of people around him. I have other colleagues who have lost their jobs as parliamentarians because they took up this issue and there were groups who organized against them to try to make sure that they were not high enough on, on that list to be able to, be, to, be, able to uh, be successful. But we have things like the Magnitsky Act, right, which was typically yeah. taken by a small group of parliamentarians in legislatures and then advanced. And those are the kinds of things that we can move forward and then give us the possibility of doing what we have talked about here as well. And in context of that, the work that IPP Forb has done has been dependent on people coming into partnership with us and supporting us. And that was one of the things that I was going to bring forward here. If you would like to have a role, there is a role for you, and that is in finding those legislators who are interested in this issue, in, in taking them up and offering to support them and providing them with the kind of encouragement that they need to continue to show bravery on this front. And for those of us who live in Canada and the United States for the most part, this is not, a, not an issue where we are threatened, but there are many places around the world where people are threatened. We also have a, a Prisoners of Conscience mm -hmm. program. Uh, the United States Commission started that. We have taken that up and are trying to encourage our members to participate in that so that people are not forgotten just because they have been arrested on, on usually trumped up charges of some sort or other. We have, uh, out of our office, have tried to take up the, the cause of the Baha'i in Iran and, and others. Uh, we have advocacy letters which have been surprisingly uh, valuable for us. When you get uh, letters that are being sent out from 15 or 20 countries going to the embassies in each of those countries, those ambassadors have to report back. And we found out that that's been much more effective than having 15 or 20 people write to one embassy. 
Um, we've been able to do, as I mentioned earlier, to go into Myanmar and Nepal with some fact-finding missions and trying to encourage those people who are there to set up the four groups and then uh, be, to be able to support them from outside their countries. We have done country-specific reports trying to point out the, uh, the various uh, aspects or issues or problems around religious freedom uh, specific to, th to them. We do have a parliamentary toolkit that's been produced in conjunction with uh, Christian uh, Solidarity Worldwide for people who are interested, legislators who are interested in this issue as well. And these national and regional groups that I talked about a little bit earlier, we need your support. We need you to back up those people who are interested and say, we've got some resources here, we've got some partnerships. We, and for those of us who are working on this issue, it's not like we're overwhelmed by people who want to participate on, on this, this yeah. issue, right? So yeah. we're looking for allies and for mm -hmm. people who will, who will join with us and ever more so those people who are in situations where they're being strongly persecuted. So I think I'll stop there. We can certainly come back to this. But uh, this is, our focus <laughs> is narrow on Article 18 and legislators, but we do not do that without a strong support base from the ground and, and people who will back us up. And, uh, and give the encouragement and strength that, that legislators need uh, to do their jobs. Thank you. Thank you. So Sharon, when it comes to being an ally and when it comes to being a resource, uh, I think the work you do, the work ADL does is quite unmatched. Uh, you know, you have been the, the driving force and the inspiration and the resource behind uh, a, a number of legislation a number of administrative steps in the U.S. as well as around the world. So when it comes to bridge building, uh, I think you, you know, set the gold standard. Okay. So uh, I would like to encourage you to share with us some of those concrete uh, projects, uh, some of those concrete initiatives. Right. Uh, and if you have time also, it would be great to hear more about the Task Force on Middle East Minorities itself, which is a bridge building attempt, a coalition building attempt par excellence. Thank you, Icon. I appreciate that. I, I agree. I think um, what I've learned from my short time at ADL is that coalition building, bridge building, and being allies, allyship, is critical if you want to move the needle. And I think both David and uh, Farhanaz's point speak to that. Um, to give you some concrete examples, because we have only five minutes left, I really want to delve into our task force, because that really epitomizes what ADL is really good at. The task force I reference is a task force on Middle East minorities, as I mentioned. It's really to uh, advocate for faith communities, uh, religious, um, ethnic, gender, and sexual minorities. It started with a real focus on Iran. Um, given the needs of the Baha'i, the Jewish, Christian, Armenian minorities, um, um, in Iran, but we've ex now expanded it to broader Middle East. Um, so, ICON, we're really thrilled that you are on there talking about what's going, going on in Turkey. Um, the Coptic uh, um, uh, issues are raised through one of our experts on um, Egypt. Uh, we have others talking about Syria um, and, and uh, so on and so forth. This uh, task force shows that by bringing together advocates, experts, scholars who really intimately know those communities that they're advocating for under the umbrella of ADL, that we together as a diverse group can go to any forum, whether it's legislators or otherwise, or it's governments, or it's uh, educators, or it's other NGOs, to really bring together thematic issues that cross the whole region when it comes to religious freedom, ethnic uh, rights, um, gender rights, and LGBT rights. So, um, we have two of our task force members here, Ali Nader and Marjan Gleenbad, both um, Iran's um, activists, human rights activists. They speak with uh, credibility that ADL cannot, because we're not on the ground in Iran. But they, through their expert work, can not only create allyship and credibility for the work we're doing, they also create bridges with other scholars and other experts from the region, like yourself. And when we speak at any forum, again, that force becomes that much more powerful. Um, and we're elevating issues that most average people don't know about. A lot of our goal is to ele elevate these issues to the public. So not only advocating with the legislators and others, but also really informing the general public um, about some of the challenges in these countries. And we feel at the ADL, we have the, the brand and we have the credibility of 100 years of advocacy, but also bringing issues, bringing attention to these issues that are very particular. And our task force members really speak to that. Um, with authenticity and credibility. 
The work we've done in the U.S., we're really building up on that. So when, as I mentioned, when it comes to our um, audits that really measure and create data-driven information, um, when we're putting things on our um, social media feed, it is talking about facts. It's about facts on the ground and what are things that we all of us have to be aware of. And communities um, right now with this task force, specifically in the Middle East, are really um, trying to get our attention to a need to be elevated. Um, otherwise, through being in the community, um, in the U.S., we feel that we're also a resource for people within those communities to come to us and bring their grievances, and then we can elevate those as well. <clears throat> it's really a feedback mechanism, and that gives us the credibility to stand in front of law lawmakers and say, we know what we're talking about because we're coming from these communities ourselves. So it's been, it's been a learning experience, but the task force kind of elevates our work to an international realm, bringing it to, to the Middle East. And, um, you know, in fact, with Miramar and, and other communities as well, we feel that ADL needs to speak up on behalf of, of those communities as well, um, as, as well as Igor is now in China. That's another issue that we're looking at and we want to elevate. So the more credibility we have, the better we can advocate for some of these issues. So we're getting the sign that we need to move on to the Q&A. But before we do that, let me do my magic lightning round. <laughs> and where we will get a one-sentence answer from each one of our panelists. And I'll begin with Farah Naz. If you had a magic wand, what would you change in lawmakers or in advocacy organizations to improve things? Just one sentence. What would you change? If I had a magic wand, um, I would, um, I give, I can't say anything much about the lawmakers, but okay. advocacy yeah. organizations yeah. stop thinking as a Christian evangelical organization or a Jewish organization or a Muslim organization. Really, you guys, the time is here. This is time for all of us to really unite, those of us who understand these issues, and there are not many of us. We really need to work together. People who have the money, bring your money. People who have the expertise, bring your expertise. People who have the scholarship, bring that. And people who have a global stage, whether it is nationally in Canada or internationally like you, it's, you know what, we're powerful. There are not many of us, but there's a lot of power. And it can be done. This is this transnational, I'm telling you here today. That was more than one sentence. But That's a long Pakistani <laughs> sentence, very elaborate. David, if you had a magic uh, wand. I would have every person understand that they are a person of faith, that they believe in, in, in things that, of which they don't know. They, every person has a perspective on where they've come from, who they are right now, and where it is that they're going. And perhaps if we all had that, we'd have more patience and tolerance for other people's perspective. Thank you. And Sharon? I think I would build on both uh, Farina's and David's uh, to say that we are all interconnected and that it takes all of us to come together. So that coalition building, bridge building, allyship, if we don't speak up for one another, we are all kind of doomed as well. So to, to know the interconnectivity of each of us as faith groups and others, um, that we need to speak up for one another and that that is the way to really move the needle. Great. Thank you all. And now let me turn to the members of our audience for Q&A. Uh, please introduce yourself. Please uh, let us know which members of the panel you're addressing your question to. And more importantly, please pose a question. <laughs> no need to be shy. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for this insight. Um, my name is Hevi Buzo. I'm the Bureau Chief of Orient TV, and my question is for both Sharon and Farhanaz. Farhanaz, mm -hmm. um, it's basically, I mean, what we've been hearing is that Muslim countries are the countries that where we have more persecution against minority groups. And uh, Farhanaz, you mentioned that how there could be policies to actually, um, you know, punish. Uh, lawmakers and legislators who are allowing this and changing these laws and Sharon you're working on the Middle East which is a very hot spot for the, all of this big problem that is continuing to face the world. Um, what do you recommend on doing and implementing these policies to pressure governments in that region in these Muslim countries or force them or, or pressure them to actually change these laws and, and you know 
get punishment to those who do not. Thank you. I'm happy to go first. Um, I'll give you two concrete examples. Um, in the Middle East, we can look at Qatar versus Bahrain. So um, I really believe, and I think ADL and all of us who are political scientists understand that carrots and sticks are both needed. So when uh, ADL looks at the work of uh, uh, and, and this, the, the, what, the messaging that's coming out, legislator, um, legislation um, coming out of Qatar today, through its television network, Al Jazeera, through its, some of its other treatment of minorities, we know at ADL that we have to call it out. And we will name and shame all we have to. And we will not play um, nice to governments that are very much the mouthpiece of hate um, towards their religious minorities. So um, that is something that ADL takes very seriously and we will continue to do so. The other side of it is example of a country like Bahrain. Bahrain has this year and last taken very important historic steps to not only acknowledge uh, the protection of its religious minorities and the Jewish community, has taken very brave steps towards Israel. Um, and we as ADL feel very, it's very important for us to commend it, to welcome it, to give them credit for it, and to work with them and enable them to do better. So I think we, we feel like we have to do both um, and depends on what the needs are. Um, calling things out when they're needed, putting uh, really responsibility and onus on regimes that are spreading hate, that are oppressing their own minorities. And on the other hand, when governments are doing well, are taking brave steps, even if it's for their own interest, it doesn't matter. Even better, if it's in their national interest to be good to their uh, minorities, to the region that they live in, to the neighborhoods that they're in. All the better, commend it, welcome it, give them credit. So I just want to use two very practical, I hope that answers your question a bit. Um, what I'd like to say to you is, you know, there is, there is no real system right now, right? So even in the United States. Um, we saw just a few days ago, the United Nations the letter about China's persecution of the Uyghur Muslims. Not a single Muslim majority country signed it. I'm ashamed to say, not one. Now, when you come to the United States part of it, whether it's the US Congress or the US government, if a country is a US ally, for example, Saudi Arabia, with its Shia population and other religious minority populations, Many other, whether it's Egypt with the Coptic Christians, there are many relations the United States has. And at, in the UN structure, many countries that are then represented, and there is no downside for them. How can the US say, you are our most allied ally, but you do these things which goes against the you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you absolutely go against what exists in the US Constitution in terms of faith. But because of trade, because of aid, because of money, we, the United States, will ignore our core values. So both at the UN and on the, at, the, at the US stage, as I said, whether it's Congress or whether it's the government, we are failing our own people. And we are failing our sisters and brothers all over the world. And so I would say we need to really focus on US Congress. And we really need to work on the White House. And the last thing I'll say on this is I find the problem with uh, the right on this is they're selective. Mm -hmm. Are you my kind of faith-based community mm -hmm. in America? And the problem with the left is they are so uncomfortable with talking about faith at all. Uh, really understanding religious persecution as a core human rights issue. That, you know, so that also has Absolutely. to be handled. Absolutely, right. Yes, please. Good afternoon, I'm Luann Sabatier with 21 Wilberforce, and to your point, the US Congress, tomorrow we release the third annual International Religious Freedom Congressional Scorecard. 
I want my question first is to um, the representative from ADL. Only once did I hear the panel really kind of nod a little bit to the public. And there is power in the grassroots. Mm. When you mentioned Turkey, only the Manitsky Act came when the grassroots went to their congressmen yes. and the faith groups and everyone cried out. And that's when Congress stood yeah. up and they went for months before they, so the power of the grassroots. Right. What we find is the grassroots, they don't know. They have no literacy. And so across 200 civil society groups, even the US, I do have a question here, is that we don't communicate to our grassroots. We have a great government parliamentarians. We have great advocates. But our people are saying, what can we do? They're so frustrated. So how do you get your grassroots engaged when they cry out, we have seen Congress will respond, governments will respond. So the power of the public is an important coalition group that we find, and I've spent 40 years as a communicator, they're overlooked. So we're not tapping into our own networks. When they, and one last thing, only in the United States in 1998 did the International Religious Freedom Act become enacted when all the groups, amnesty, human rights, right. came with the evangelicals, came with the mm -hmm. Catholic bishops. Only then did we start some leadership. And so we've got our own example. We just need to magnify that. How do you do it at ADL? I think that's a continues to be a challenge, and we, you know, obviously use social media um, in the best way we can. That's become a huge tool for us. We've really leaned in to getting our messaging out through social media. Um, our communications department is growing as we speak, um, and we try to really show uh, publicly to as many groups as possible that we're bringing value. So it has to be a two-way uh, communication. We have to show that we're listening and we're bringing in their issues, but we're also feeding back, this feeding back mechanism of what are uh, our insights, what are our best practices. And because we have our 25 offices, that really are, is our platform into communities, into the hearts of the cities in the US where these issues are, are showing manifesting themselves. So we are parts of communities when it comes to issues with law enforcement, when it comes to religious issues, when it comes to ethnic communities that are within the hearts of our American cities. Um, I'll give you an example. We signed a, um, an agreement with the Mexican uh, Foreign Ministry, the ADL did last a year and a half ago, because, and it just kind of comes out of our faith issues, but this is just to show you how minorities can have an impact. The Mexican Foreign Minister tells ADL that because of the language and discourse in, in this country about migrants coming in from Mexico, Mexican nationals were ex experiencing extreme hate crimes against them because of their identity. And they had nowhere to go because they were afraid to go to the police. So they were turning to the Mexican consulates and going to them for uh, legal advice, for protection. And the foreign minister of Mexico asked ADL to provide trainings to all their consular staff across the US um, on what is a hate crime, what are the legal, legal uh, steps they can take, what, what is the designation of a hate crime even. So for the last two years, that's what we've done. We have gone across America, they have 50 consulates, the Mexicans do in, in the US, and trained all their staff on what is a hate crime and what are the legal ramifications that any, uh, any citizen or otherwise, it doesn't, doesn't matter what their legal standing is, has against uh, hate crimes that are perpetrated against them. So this is an example where something that came from the grassroots to us was elevated to the government. They came back to us and then we were able to go back to our communities. So right now we just actually announced a national campaign, information campaign, about rights of nationals of any country who have national hate crimes perpetrated against them and what steps they can take. So again, we're bringing that information back to the community. So I agree with you. It is not easy, but we have to do it and you're absolutely right. David, do you want to add something? Well, quickly, for those of us who are elected, of course, the electorate is critical or we don't have our job, but uh, to flip that around, I've told people who've come to me to lobby me, come with a narrow focus. Come with one or two things. Don't come to me 10 different groups with 10 different things because that lets me ignore you completely and focus on the people who are really focused and have an idea of specifically what they want. Mm -hmm. So um, you're talking about successes. Those typically come when people get organized, they get together, and they come to the legislators with one ask and say, we need this done. And, and focus and stay, yes, and stay on it until you get it, then go on to your next thing. Don't do the shot, you want to do the ri rifle shot, not the shotgun shot, where 
everything's up in the air and, and I don't have to do anything for you and we're you know so that, that would just be my advice and I've watched it time and again it works focus mm -hmm. get what you want go on to the next thing then Ed Hi, my name is Ed Brown. I work for the Stephanus Alliance International. We are a Norwegian Christian organization focused on promoting freedom of religion and belief for everyone. And we also have forward literacy as one of our focus points. Question has to do with um, contextuality and international norms. Sometimes it's a challenge using the international language in certain contexts. How do you meet those needs? And could you then provide some positive examples around the world, initiatives, uh, policies, that have proven effective. Thank you. Hmm. I think you should. I think <laughs> ICON has yeah. examples of that too in Turkey. <coughs> Go ahead. Please. Go ahead. I love well, you. Well, just yeah. quickly on this, Ed, of course, was our, uh, our coordinator for IPP Ford for a couple of years, so he knows us well, <laughs> and, and we know him well. But um, I think in terms of what we're trying to do at IPP Ford is we want local, national, regional groups to set up so they have their language, they have their issues, and then we will try to give them the support that they need from their perspective. So I think that's, that's far better than us coming with, I've got a Canadian perspective here on what you need to do in your country, I'm going to tell you how to do it because that has never worked, it doesn't work well. But if we can come and say, look, if we can give you some training on the principles of FORB, if we can give you some training on how, for new MPs, how legislation may work in your parliament, on, on how you can initiate advocacy letters, those kinds of things, then we can get them involved, they get a better understanding of the issue, and as they get a more complete understanding, they become more effective members of parliament or, or legislators and can move ahead on that. So that's, our goal is not to direct them, our goal is to actually assist them and see if we can get them to get some results in their part of the world and then we can all celebrate that. So le let me reflect uh, on the issue of hate crimes. Um, one of my key issues in the Turkish parliament was to legislate a comprehensive hate crimes bill in a country that lacked it. And before my time in parliament, I have worked with advocacy organizations, with academia, to put together a coalition in support of hate crimes bill in Turkey. And there was a lot of that know-how transfer, you know, how to transfer national and international law into Turkey and into Turkish. Now, uh, one great lesson we learned along the way is uh, I was working with a coalition for hate crimes in Turkey, multi-faith, from different ethnic backgrounds, gender organizations, labor unions, youth organizations, and it was a learning process. It's what one might call localization. How you translate international norms into a, a, a local parlance. In the Turkish case, what was a great learning experience for me was all these vulnerable communities, targets of hate crimes, after a year of deliberations, said that we want a hate crimes bill but we do not want a hate speech bill. I was quite surprised. I said, but you have been smeared, you have been tarred, you have been targeted every day by state-run or pro-government media. And you don't want a hate speech bill? And they told me, we live in a country where there is severe restrictions on freedom of speech. And if we have a hate speech bill, we are afraid the government will use it yep. to further restrict mm -hmm. hate speech. So they said, we're okay with a hate crimes bill. That's just about hate crimes against you know, life, property, you know, religious establishments, whatsoever, but no hate speech bill. And guess what? They were right, right. because uh -huh. my hate crimes bill was butchered in parliament with, through Erdogan's majority, and it turned into almost a quasi-blasphemy bill. Oh, and yes. which to us all a learning mm -hmm. opportunity mm -hmm. that localization, you know, adaptation of international norms to nation state settings always takes, I think, a lot of care, mm -hmm. a lot of prudence, mm -hmm. and at the same time, uh, I guess, a bit of luck to Absolutely. move forward. Absolutely. Yes. We have a colleague over here. Yes, please. Sorry, thank you. Hi. I have a question for you. Uh, my name is Ajit Sahi, and I represent a Muslim organization. It's called Indian American Muslim Council. 
and we uh, work on ad we do advocacy capacity building and campaigning on issues of minority religious minorities in India. Um, in recent years, especially in the last few weeks, we've seen a mushrooming of violence against Muslims especially. We are a strange country because we have a minority which totals 200 million. I don't think there's any country in the West anywhere <laughs> that has even half that population, apart from, of course, United States. Um, we, as a Muslim organization, and I'm not Muslim, I am a Hindu working for that organization, we, we explicitly condemn anti-Semitism and we speak against it. But it's important for organizations such as yourself, which is very, very skilled and very reputed globally, for you to come forward and condemn what is happening. Yesterday, members of the India's ruling political party, they had a meeting in New Delhi, the capital of India, where they said Muslims are breeding and proliferating in India. And we need to bring a forced family planning law in them. That should ring a bell for ADL, certainly. Absolutely. Yes. So Muslims are being told they can't pray, they should not grow their beards, they should not wear skull caps, they should not have their names, they should take Hindu names. Would ADL, an organization like ADL, consider coming out and speaking out against such bigotry in India? Because India is the world's second most populated country. If India falls, trust me, it's going to have a domino impact all over the world, the likes of which we haven't even seen in the Middle East. Thank you so much. Thank you for that question. Absolutely. Uh, please, I would like to connect you with my our, uh, DC-based colleague here. We would like to know about it. Any of you who have issues within your own communities that you think ADL should know about, please come to us. We rely on our partners to know about what's going on. So that is an issue that once we look into it, we'll be happy to elevate and advocate for. Um, it is also imperative for us as a Jewish organization that we speak up on behalf of all faiths. It is very important. In Iran, when we speak about our task force, my Iran colleagues speak on behalf of Sunnis in Iran that are being mm. oppressed as we speak today. So it is, you lose credibility if you pick and choose, and I think to Farhanaz's point, you cannot only speak to your own, you know, to your own personal interests. So we'll be happy to. Please make sure that at the end we'll come together and I'll get your credentials that we can talk about that. It is, it, without that, you have no credibility. So as ADL, we feel very strongly to speak up on behalf of um, any sort of uh, discrimination against Muslims. We've done it in this country against the Muslim ban. I mean, we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of voices on this, but uh, internationally as well. Thank you for raising that. Would, would you like to reflect on this? Or maybe the work you do with you know, uh, Asian parliamentarians as well? Um, I would absolutely. Yeah. I have started working on India now. I'm, I'm looking at South Asia uh, now, in, and my next book is going to be um, dealing with religious persecution and laws, etc., in South Asia. And um, what you are describing about in India is absolutely true, but also heartbreaking, because India was that secular country where people of all faiths celebrated and practiced their faith. Muslims are being lynched every week. Yes, but also people of no faith at all were also free to have no faith in yes. India. And now the Muslims, of course, number one, and because of Muslims in India number the same amount as Muslims in Pakistan, 200 million. Um, but Christ, your Christian community also I know there are many partnerships now because you have to be the big brother with more population taking care of Christians from India, which I know that a lot of your groups are. We work together with Christian groups in the United States a lot. Right. And even in the but um, it, it's very, very, very painful. And that bug now, you see Sri Lanka, you see that mm. whole region. Um, if I may just add one point, I mean, really what we have to be very aware of is really populism. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the political yes, phenomenon absolutely. that we have to be aware of. A lot yeah. of what we're all describing happening in India, happening in Europe, yes. happening in Latin America and Brazil, you see it as well, happening throughout the Middle East, is this notion of populist leaders bringing extreme views, putting their finger exactly on the sensitivities of their populations, on the anxieties that the populations are feeling, and pushing it really hard and then turning that into xenophobia. So it's really about populism and what political leaders today are utilizing as very dangerous political moves 
to try to manipulate, gain favor, and yes. So what's happening in India you're describing is is really a reflection of what's happening to Indian society but this in is general. The world's biggest democracy we're you know, talking about. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what yeah. She said about India. Yeah. I, you know, a lot of my Muslim friends say we are a minority, and I say, my friend, there's no greater minority than me because in my family, I am from a Hindu family in India, and today for the first time in my life, I find nobody in my family supports me. Something strange has happened. I'm being called a self-hating Hindu. Wow. Yeah. So Can I, I just want to raise sure, a point, though. Sure. I don't think that this, that much of this problem is coming from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I think it's found in leadership. Mm -hmm. And when I see, when you talk about populism, mm -hmm. we want to support democratic principles and people having their say. What we need are leaders who are committed to mm -hmm. eternal principles of equality. That's what we need to be demanding. Absolutely. Not that people have less say, but that they have, they have understanding of what it is they're talking about and leaders who will, who will listen and, and hold those values permanently. And David, I know you would understand me if I cut you short because yes. now you have to run to the National yes. Press yes. Club <laughs> because you will be kicking off an event yes, and you. my colleagues at the Religious Freedom Institute will be really angry if I don't let him go. But yep. thank you very much to our panelists. Thank, thank you very you. much for our engaged audience. Thank you. Say hi if we see you around. <laughs>